Uh, I, perhaps I should say that um, I wouldn't mind the title of Eurosceptic or, or if it hadn't been so disfigured by these uh, terrible xenophobes. Um, if, for, if, for example, what the gentleman at the back said about double jeopardy and the uh, European law turned out to be absolutely true or could be proved to me to be true, I would change my position. One of the strong Registry. reasons I've been witnessing... Wait, I'm talking hypothetically. Okay. All right, it's a thought experiment. Do you understand? Um, if that were the case, I would have to revise my opinion because up until now one of my strong Europhile feelings has been that I'd rather face the European Court than the House of Lords if it was a matter of justice. Right? And that's a very strong part of my present case. If that turned out to be ill-founded, I'd have to rethink it. The same if the way in which various kinds of integration and um, regional questions were addressed were to be crude or um, opportunistic. But I still feel that the terrain of the struggle is a European one, and that, that one should take one stand on that ground. And that, I think that's actually been sufficiently demonstrated. There used to be people on the left, actually, there still are, who's, uh, although it's, it's funny, Peter never stresses them, um, quite a number of them, in fact, who say, well, we don't want anything to do with Europe because it's a club of capitalists. Well, actually, the United Kingdom could be perfectly well described as such a thing, if that's what the objection is. So I think one should avoid non sequitur, one should avoid tautology, and one should allow hypotheticals. It, there needs to be a form in which the centripetal and the centrifugal can be carefully handled. It's also seemed to me for a long time to be self-evident that the form, the political context in which that can take place, must be European. Because where is the solvent? Where was the real solvent of the border question between Britain and Ireland if it was not the fact that both Britain and the Republic of Ireland became members of the same customs union? At once the border began to look absurd and has become to look more absurd ever since. Why is it that Scottish and Welsh forces can ask for independence and for autonomy now knowing that they can deal with Brussels as well as London. Uh, how else could it have been? Uh, that's the only way, in other words, that it wouldn't be mere nationalism. It is the European context that has prevented uh, the Catalan and Basque questions in Spain from becoming tribal and, prevent and stop them from being as tribal as they were because there is a context in which there's another court as there is, even for us humble subjects, to, if denied justice, we can go to a court in, in Europe of the kind that Peter slandered. So that if, the, to me, the political question is the crucial one about Europe, Europe the, the, the centripetal, centrifugal balance, the two allowed Greece, Portugal, and Spain in my lifetime to, with confidence, get rid of their dictatorships, knowing that, knowing as all intelligent citizens in those countries did, they would never be allowed into the European family if it were not. Uh, for the, well, if it would not, if they, if they retained their, their dictatorial or despotic mode of government, the, the rules of the community forbid the admission of dictatorships or any but parliamentary democracies. It is also this that prevents Hungary and Romania from, uh, from contesting Transylvania now. Both of them want to be members of the European Union. They will not be allowed to import a tribal quarrel in, into the European Union. They are on good behavior for that reason. There is even a possibility that the filthy consequences of British policy in Cyprus can be undone by, the, by a careful European handling of Greek-Turkish relations. And what does the right wing say? We don't want to do business with foreigners. We don't want them interfering in our internal affairs. We reserve the right to say to the extraordinarily sober and disciplined and decent and conscientious political class in Germany, we don't know how lucky we are to be dealing with such people. We reserve the right we reserve the right to, to daily visit upon them the crudest and most vulgar and hateful insults. And we reserve the right, as Mrs. Thatcher did the other day, to reward their patience and Europeanism. A country that openly says, we want a Europeanized Germany, not a Germanized Europe. We want to enlarge Europe, so to speak, to restrain ourselves, to contain ourselves and our history. To speak of them in the most spiteful and nauseating terms, and to, and to say that only English-speaking countries have played a civilized role in Europe in this century. Where does this arrogance come from? Where does this, how is this demagogy permitted? This is the British version of fascism. I think there must be many people living in Holland now, and Belgium, well, I'll just say this, John, and maybe very many people 
living in Holland and Belgium still to this day, <clears throat> who could have done without the Anglo-German naval agreement of 1934, which allowed the Nazis to build a gigantic fleet and encouraged, and encouraged their own rearmament. I think there is a hideous, I make the direct allegation that there is a hideous, vicarious superego at work in the minds of the late Alan Clark, after all a tremendous Germanophile, of the Tory historians like Charmley and the others who have a secret admiration actually for the Germany that uh, Britain defeated. Um, and they're venting this uh, buried and disgusting memory of, their, of the behavior of their own party and their own class now in an attempt uh, at, just, at reviving the cheapest form of xenophobia and chauvinism. And I would really feel awful if any member of any uh, branch of our family had anything to do with anything like any of that, okay? 